critical focus is uh, managing your fears and anxieties. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I guess I just wanted to start with that general question. I mean, it, it seems to me it's, um, um, I, I mean, nothing like this has ever happened before in anybody's lifetimes, <laughs> you know, any, anybody alive now. And uh, um, it seems like, I wonder if maybe the, the usual techniques for that you might tell people, like if there's, there, like, is there, are there techniques you've been using that are applicable or do you have to kind of, I, I mean, well, I guess the first question is, are you still working virtually with, with patients like remotely or, yeah. Yeah. So what was just so wonderful and why I feel another very fortunate is my whole practice seamlessly transitioned in one week from in person oh. to a combination of video like zoom and mm -hmm. uh, phone. Okay. People choosing, you know, what they felt comfortable. Some some people really struggle to see themselves on a video camera, and it's they're just too distracting. So. <laughs> it, can, it can be, yeah. yeah exactly. um, it's, that's natural. You, have they all been able to migrate uh, online, or yes, you know, like like all, yeah, yes, okay. uh, yeah. Every single person that I work with, um, okay. has decided to continue to work. And um, the work in some cases has shifted to just dealing with the present moment, right? And that's sort of when you're talking about feelings and emotions, mm -hmm. there's a real sort of understanding of how, what emotions happen when there's an actual danger in the present moment. Mm -hmm. And when typically most of my work is on helping people process emotions from childhood, you know, traumas and adverse events. Right. safety in the moment and so yeah that's the first thing to kind of validate and to work with although the emotion work you know when we first spoke about my book uh and the article it's not always depression and the tool the change triangle that is more applicable than ever it's the same principles but it's knowing the difference between the present trauma and that fear is going to be triggered appropriately and then how to manage fear to assess whether you're in immediate danger that that type of thing so i'm i, I, I don't want to get ahead of you and i want to let you ask questions but that's kind of um an important distinction that we're now working with okay a threat um okay so this is something that's tended to come up with with your clients then, uh, like like pr with, okay. with 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 pretty much everyone would you say or yeah yeah to some degree and it's interesting how now like uh like three weeks into working with people um they sort of wrap their head around and are calmer staying put and um mm -hmm. we're now sort of getting into you know what should what would be helpful to work on in this time when yeah. actually there's not a lot of incoming in you know stimulation and we can really pick and choose what you want to work on so that when everything gets back to normal mm -hmm. which it will whatever that new normal hopefully new improved normal will be um, yeah that this is time well spent again like the first thing you have to do is take care of what can you do to get some mod modicum of, of safety you know, that you're not going to be out on the street, that you have a, a safe place to live and that you have food, food and shelter. Mm. Um, yeah. And then after that, it's really the, the people that I work with that have young children at home, really hard. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to work and deal with young children. And that is it's stressful. Yeah. Do you have, do you have children? Yeah. yeah. They're, older <laughs> they're, they're, in, uh, they're nine and 11. Yeah. So they're a little older, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. Yeah they can self-regulate a extent. little bit more right than uh, some people i know have like you know two and four and it's oh yeah and full-time jobs both parents yeah and uh so depressed they are just depressed because yeah it's boring it's you don't have the patience you can't enjoy any aspect of being with the kids and that's right. the question can one shift that anxiety to kind of okay you know how do we break up a day, work mm -hmm. together as opposed to fighting because a lot of spouses and partners are fighting. Mm -hmm. So that's something where there's a lot of wiggle room for coaching and for psychological help and support. Like let's okay. do the best we, how do we just 
do the best we can so we feel the best we can to mm -hmm. get through this situation which is temporary even though it feels like forever which is an important yeah. mantra that i tell people over and over and over again you know to remember that above all it's temporary yeah it's temporary right which really helps get through something it feels like forever and a mood feels right. like forever but it in actuality right. it's temporary it's a small well, well i guess you know, if you live yeah except for people who lose people and that's another right motion well i guess because it, it's temporary but at the same time you don't know how long it'll go on for which might make it feel you know like if you if you know how long something will last it's much easier to endure it i guess yes um yeah so i think that's uh, right and i think we can make some educated guesses i mean one thing that's been helpful too i have a huge i have a big science background from my time as a dentist and all that. So, I mean, there is a logic to how this thing is going to progress in my mind and it keeps being validated, um, you know, in, in yeah. terms of like they have to get testing, they have to know who's got antibodies, right. who doesn't, blah, blah, blah. Then people can start to go back to work, you yeah. know, medicine, if you get sick, and then the vaccine. And so there's sort of a timeline that seems to have an end yeah. that people can count on. Yeah. Okay. So, so before you were saying that, um, a lot of um, so then with your clients are, are are you helping them through just the um, the tensions or, or uh, the feelings related to being at home with their kids and 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 the tensions that arise between spouses and things like that. So that's something that 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 you've been working with them on then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. On on any variety on their anxiety, on their sadness, on over identifying with suffering of others when you can sort of take a break from that. Really any type of, you know, in, in most of the way that I work, and it's not only with clients because um, from the book, I, I deal with a lot of people out in the world. I've been writing articles to try to help people, um, you know, give them tools and tips and focusing on this particular situation. And, um, and I hear from people through email and social media a lot. So it's, it's, it's a broad base of people from all over the world. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. So whatever people need help with, right? This is triggering of every emotion that there is. And mm -hmm. if people can make space at least to validate that, you know, if you start to just block the emotions, eventually it's going to make one feel worse, whether they get anxious or depressed or to start to rely on um, numbing, you know, drinking and, and drugging and, and those types right. of things. So the, the right. idea is to have a balance you don't want to be mired in your emotions all the time, especially um, when it's happening right now, that there's a certain amount of protection that we can build. You know, like I, I help people using imagination who are overly empathic, who are overly sympathetic, right? And they're just mm -hmm. triggered all day long by the suffering. And then you've got people on the opposite side who aren't in touch enough with what they're feeling. And this idea of balance, yeah. Like anything else, it's it's common sense, right? You need to do what needs to be done, and you also need to do self care, and the balance of those two things are, is crucial. Right. You find your own balance because it's unique for everybody to find that uh, sweet spot, and it's not a perfect. You just it's an ongoing kind of lifetime practice of kind of getting to know yourself and and what you need and what's best for you. Okay. The you mentioned before the. Can you talk about how the change triangle might be applicable? I mean, I mean, I, I understand that for work with sort of varied uh, emotions and confronting those, but is it also helpful in in the in, in the case of these new emotions people are feeling because of this um, because of what's happening? You know, can you talk about that? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So the change triangle, um, as you may recall, is. It's a, what I love about it, um, and I, you know, again, I didn't invent it, I adapted it from the academic liter literature. It's a simple tool to explain the relationship between the way we block emotions um, on the top of the triangle with defenses and anxiety and guilt and shame being on the top of the triangle. And then right. the point of the triangle, these core emotions, which are, which come up in, they're meant to, 
come up based on what's happening in real time in the environment. Mm -hmm. So we're trying, you know, all, all sort of the mindfulness and awareness um, info that we've been getting more and more about being in the present moment. So in the present moment, we are at different times based on if we listen to the news, based on what we're seeing our neighbors uh, happening, you know, if an ambulance pulls up, that type of thing, we're going to get a, 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 a natural and normal human trigger, let's say to fear. Um, or the other co the core emotions are anger, sadness, fear, disgust, mm -hmm. joy, excitement, and sexual excitement. Those are going to come up naturally uh, on a daily basis for mm -hmm. many people. And yeah. so the change triangle just tells you to what they are, those core emotions, so that you can slow down, maybe take five minutes, a couple of times a day, even once a day, kind of ground your feet on the floor, take a few deep breaths and tune inside and just simply validate, you know, I feel sad. Mm -hmm. I am scared. Mm -hmm. I am disgusted with the way the government is handling certain things. Yeah. Um, and I'm angry, you know, if I'm a healthcare worker uh, or if I work at Amazon, I'm angry that I'm not being protected, I'm not being paid enough. So if we can right, simply right. validate that and have a few, t few tools to let those emotions kind of flow, remember at the bottom of the triangle was that open right. hearted state, right? So what that means is if we don't bury emotions with muscular tension and anxiety and all sorts of pushing down, but if we find a way to let them flow, validating them, sensing them in our body, using imagination, sharing them with a person and, and someone who's a good listener, um, that we will, the body, the, the emotions will come up like a wave and then do what they need to do, you either have a cry, either feel a little trembly from fear, like we can get into each emotion, but mm -hmm. if you allow it, the brain and body should settle down and you should sort of feel like, oh, that was you know a little relief and now I can go on and do what needs to be done. Right, okay. So so it can help with more immediate emotions as to as well as the- Absolutely. Or the immediate traumas as well as the varied ones, yeah. Absolutely, I use the, the change triangle every day and my cue to use it is, is again, I feel something in my body. So I, and I immediately, instead of escaping it by ruminating or- Yeah. Uh, you know, going up, distracting, I will come down, I'll, I'll be with it, again, with compassion, lack of judgment, there's no like pre precision here, it's doing the best you can, seeing what feels right as the barometer, and, um, and just try to name the emotion. Now, if I feel generally anxious, or what would be called in the jargon as dysregulated, which means like it's that horrible thing you know, you just don't, you feel off your game. You know your nervous system has been activated and, um, and triggered by various um, different emotions that are too much and overwhelming, various conflicting emotions, like mm -hmm. I love my husband and I hate my husband right now because he's not helping me enough around the house. Mm -hmm. Then we have, can move up into anxiety and then the change triangle, you know, says, okay, if we're on the anxiety corner, we need to come down and see, you know, ask yourself, am I sad? check. Am I angry? Check. And just validate with ands, right? I am this and this and this, not this, but this, which cancels each other out. So we just right. want to make space. And I, I, I ask patients, you know, let's really slow down because that's the key to feeling safer and calmer. And let's go through each emotion. And if there's a lot of core emotions happening at one time, we kind of want to imagine that we in, internally grow bigger so that you can almost imagine each emotion separated with lots of space and air. Because when mm -hmm. emotions kind of get on top of each other, we feel anxious. Yeah. So, and we can use all these imaginate, imaginative ways to work with feelings because it's just a blessing that the, that the, the brain works that way where you can use fantasy to change how we feel. And we know that from science, from uh, hooking people up to uh, fMRIs and asking them to imagine if they're running and then mm -hmm. the brain lights up as if they were actually running. Right, right. So, uh, it allows us a lot of um, room to use. Um, yeah. Uh, or like if you're reading about, 
experiencing something, your brain lights up. That's one thing I've heard. Yes. Exactly. And I've been doing this. I'm a big hugger. My patients know not for people that don't want hugs and there's always a lot of permission and talk, but for people that really rely on hugs, a, a lot of my patients were neglected as babies and infants, not mm -hmm. on, maybe they were in incubators or maybe um, their parents were just didn't understand emotions and had to be good parents. Um, yeah. We've yeah. been experimenting uh, a couple of people with this idea, you know, that, uh, that say, you know, I, I wish I missed the hugs. I wish I could have them. And we close our eyes. I suggest mm -hmm. people wrap their arms around each other. Hmm. We both do that. We close our eyes and we try to conjure up the vivid feeling. And this you could do, you know, with your mother or, you know, your aging relatives, uh, yeah. comfort who are in isolation. Um, you imagine, I say, just can you, can you remember how I feel with my arms around you and on the base of your head mm -hmm. and, you know, making cooing noises. And it sounds so hokey and, you know, some people would probably go, you know, scoff at that, but yeah, several patients say, oh my God, I can't believe it feels more real than I yeah. ever would have thought that it would have. So okay. Sweet. Uh, same case in point, same thing, uh, one way to regulate anxiety in, in the moment again, is to close your eyes, go to a quiet room, and just pick your favorite place that you want to visit, like the beach, mm -hmm. and see the water, see the sun, feel the sun on your skin, to try to activate all five senses in a particular mm -hmm. area. And we use this in, in trauma work quite a bit, like in EMDR, where you light up a memory, and um, for better and for worse memories, and you activate the body by remembering how what the moment looked like the sounds that you heard the smells that you heard the, the touch yeah. that you felt and mm -hmm. um, so it's tried and true it works yeah. if you give yourself okay. permission you know so many people have defenses that say oh this is hokey it's bs you know i'm not going to try that probably i'm guessing particularly men more than women would struggle mm. to allow themselves to self-soothe in those ways yeah but okay. i would recommend yeah. Yeah. Are, are there ways that this current crisis, because it is so unprecedented, I mean, does it, is it a challenge to apply some of the uh, sort of tried and true techniques? Um, like, like I know, I know you um, mentioned like telling people it's temporary, yeah. um, but at the same time, we don't know how temporary, <laughs> like, like how long it'll go on. I mean, are there, um, I, I mean, are there ways in which you kind of have to adapt or adjust uh, the usual techniques for managing fear and anxiety just based on something like this because it's so so new and different, you know? Yeah, I mean, in a, w in a way, not, not really. I mean, in, it's like sort of yes and no, but I know that the techniques, like uh, I'll speak for me personally, for example, there I, I notice and I hear this from the people I work with. It's like you're okay for a couple of days and then something happens and, and maybe you could tell me, um, Chris, if this happens to you, for whatever reason, something you think of or something you hear or see, there's like a spike of anxiety. And then what I've noticed is that uh, it's really stays for like a, like a full 24, sometimes 48, sometimes three days. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm calling like dysregulated. Like there's sort of a massive kind of hyper or hypo arousal of the nervous system where you just don't feel right. And it's like, mm -hmm. and it's painful and it's suffering. Yeah. Um, but the same, the same advice, uh, just with more diligence, would apply. So I write about um, and talk about, speak about, and talk with my patients about these things that I, I don't know. I haven't heard. I, I don't know if I've coined this. I haven't read it before. But these, like this idea of state changers, mm -hmm. like a, like preparing a list in advance, because when we're upset, it's very hard to think clearly of things that you try over and over and over again to calm yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, one of those would be working the change triangle to identify emotions. But like my list of state changers that I have, you know, uh, tacked up on the refrigerator is, you know, move my body, exercise, yeah, take a very hot shower or bath, right? These are yeah. things they're like, you're doing stuff to like holding ice cubes in your hand. These are, again, these, this comes from the trauma literature and trauma therapy world. Calling a friend, making yourself tea, playing with your pet, um, watching a funny uh, TV show, watching a sad TV show to help you cry or, or movie. 
it's a list of things that that you hone over time that reliably help you feel a little bit better and we're looking with people because everyone's so hard on themselves and oh this didn't work and what am i doing wrong the tiniest bits of relief are good enough just to take the edge off and there's nothing perfect if the nervous system is firing away danger 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 releasing adrenaline into the system we don't have conscious control over it. All we have conscious control over is how to try to calm it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been uh, tweeting out like, what is a panic attack? And you're not, you know, just the reassurance, you're not gonna die from a panic attack. Some anxiety <laughs> symptoms mimic COVID symptoms. So everybody gets cracked about those. And you just wanna keep trying to decrease anxiety, calm the nervous system. Meditation tapes, compassion, self-compassion tapes. Um, helping, uh, doing things for other people is very calming and distracting, like like ordering, you know, uh, uh, what my husband and I were going to order, um, half trays of eggplant parmesan from a local pizzeria and deliver it to a few um, of the elder people, the people we know in the neighborhood. And, and then mm -hmm. you get like a jolt of like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm a good person. I feel good about myself. And that like yeah. helps. Okay. Uh, okay. Playing with your kids is a great distraction when you don't want to kill them. <laughs> yeah yeah we try to get out of the house every day you know i think as long as they can go out and romp around you know no, that's right there's like a walk another state yeah. changer so mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah so i I, have, I like that idea of state changers and uh mm -hmm. it's, it's a very concrete easy thing i'm upset let me go to my list of state changers and don't even think about it just try them one by one again and again right. i think about a week ago i was so upset and I was running and, and my, uh, I'm lucky I have a, um, an elliptical trainer at home. And, you know, for the first 15 minutes, I thought I was actually going to have a heart attack. My heart rate was so high from the anxiety, but I just stayed and I deep breathed. And about a, and a half an hour into the workout, I felt that shift. So it's like you can't quit too soon. And you got to yeah. keep doing it and keep doing it. And it's science. You know, it's yeah. just um, yeah. trusting yeah. science and trusting yourself and, and knowing Again, when you cycle in a few times, when you're upset, when all else fails, the reminder, it's temporary again, that mood's yeah. always shifting. So it may take a week at most, but you're going to wake up one day and go, oh my God, I feel better. And yeah. Write that down if you forget, remember, so that you yeah. can remind themselves in upsetting states that it passes. There, um, it, when you mentioned writing down the things that, that help, Right. Mm -hmm. um, is that is that a way of revisiting, revisiting it over time to see what works best and maybe moving those up on the list or, you know, sort of trial and error? Yeah. Exactly. And that's a, like another great project. And that, that'll last you for the rest of your life. Right. Because life is yeah. full of suffering, losses yeah. and fears. And um, yeah. So, okay. yes, it's a, it's a handy tool. I teach this to college students a lot, you know, just oh, yeah. thinking of it that way. Have your list of state changers ready. Oh, okay. Okay. Because of the, yeah, they're under a lot of stress, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, you mentioned anxiety symptoms can mimic uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, symptoms. Um, I know, can you talk about that a bit? Like, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I, I've known this about, I'll, I'll, again, I'll start with me. Um, when I get, it, it's, it's a special type of anxiety. It's like a really like intense kind of traumatic anxiety than, you know, that I've had when I've dealt with you know, the, the real adverse events in my life, I get like the, the back of my throat hurts. Hmm. It feels thick and hmm. like there's a lump and, you know, it's like, what's wrong with my throat? It feels a little bit tighter. Like I have a little bit more trouble breathing. Mm -hmm. um, a good friend of mine who's a doctor felt a pain and a pressure in his heart and he hmm. didn't know he had COVID and pneumonia. And he said, you know, but it's probably anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, certainly headaches yeah. so between the throat between the headaches and between the tightness in the chest and difficulty yeah. breathing mm -hmm. anxiety those are all symptoms of anxiety aches and pains mm -hmm. and back aches are uh, symptoms of anxiety nausea and stomach aches are symptoms anxiety can go anywhere it can cause ear fatigue. ringing hmm? fatigue fatigue of course yeah. absolutely so yeah. Um, so it's important to, to read up on those, to wait a day yep. before you panic, to 
right. work on lowering anxiety, using state changers and naming emotions. And um, people can reach out for teletherapy too. There's the, the my communities um, in the social work and uh, psychotherapy world are really active to, there's um, teletherapy, there's tons of support groups. It just really helps to connect. Even okay. if you're alone, you're not alone. There's, there's all you have to do is have the courage to, to yeah. Google support groups and um, you're gonna find them across the world. I did actually need to ask you about that, like resources people can check out. Um, is there, um, are there any particular like URLs or, uh, or, or sites that people could go to? You mentioned that, did you say a community of social workers that's, that's working on this or something? Or what yeah, I mean, but not an organized community, just, you know, through my, through all my networks and listservs. But I would say, um, you know, first of all, first and foremost, what I, my, my, half of my life is dedicated to creating resources to help people with emotions. So my okay. website is a great place for people to poke mm -hmm. around and to Google my name. I've had various articles come out um, in, in major media outlets that talk about tips and tools. So people can Google the change triangle and they can Google my name and they mm -hmm. can go to my website if you want to send them to that. Mm -hmm. um, just to understand emotions, it's so helpful, just a basic education. And the book uh, it's not always depression where if you have time, if you're sequestering and self-quarantining and wanting to do some personal growth work, the gentle mm -hmm. exercises. So I'm just going to put that out there. I also have a YouTube channel, mm -hmm. you know, you can Ground and Breathe with me, where um, there's resources like maybe even you'll let me pop this up here to help people too. Yeah. Um, then uh, NAMI, the National um, Alliance for Mental Illness, uh, is just um, has lots and lots of resources and support groups. But I would Google um, if someone is wanting to talk to someone, mm -hmm. they have to figure out one if they want a, a peer group and then just Google peer support groups to get through COVID or something like that. Just keep trying mm -hmm. and, and you have to do some research and homework. I wish I, I had a perfect place to send everybody, but I don't. And, and everyone's needs are different. Um, I would also look up into teletherapy and um, people can, I, I, you know, on the one hand, um, I have resources if somebody, if you wanted to put my email or certainly my social media handles out there, people do ask me for how to get connected to therapists and I, yeah. I have some resources that I could share. But again, a lot of this you can Google and find out because yeah, you know, that's, that's for all the bad parts about the internet, it's really, coming in quite handy during this crisis. Yeah. yeah. And um, <coughs> and I know there's lots of podcasts uh, out there that are giving, and there's an, like meditation apps. There's a, there's a, um, there's a simple habit is an app that I contract with because I put up meditation audios and, and emotion, I had to work with emotion audios, but there's, you know, my, uh, what are the other, the meditation apps that really helps because meditation calms the mind and body too. Yeah. So you have to figure out whether you want individual therapy or whether you want to be in some sort of group setting. Right. right. And um, people should know also, you know, groups like AA and NA and online, those are all online now. And so yeah. you can go to those groups too if, um, okay. if you just like the idea of um, sh just hearing people share and sharing back with very little crosstalk and yeah not led by a leader yeah right okay um all right um let's see i know uh i feel like a, a lot of what we've been talking about is very applicable to fear and anxiety of course um one thing i want to ask about is um grief like if that might be kind of a separate uh, if, if these techniques might be applicable to that too because i've read that people these days might be grieving for you know, the world as it was, right? Yes. Um, or obviously grieving for lost loved ones. I mean, yes. um, are there are there techniques to pass along in, in, in that regard? Yes, it's so important. In fact, I just posted today on my um, social media um, an article okay. I'd written called How to Be with Sadness. Mm -hmm. And I have another post on, on grief. Yeah, I mean, it's the same principle, right? That, well, a couple things. One, in terms of taking on the weight of the world and being and letting yourself 
over like if everything in your immediate world all your loved ones and your friends are okay mm -hmm. but you find yourself grief stricken and a wreck at all times because you're you're thinking of like if i think about what's going on in the new york hospital system mm -hmm. i mean it, it's devastating i can visualize it and it's so scary and it's so sad and i feel so sad for all those people um I don't let myself stay there. And uh, I've worked hard on myself, kind of being able to compartmentalize when I need. It's not always so easy, but after a while, again, it's that idea of like shifting into another state, uh, uh -huh. another state of mind. So I would, to the people who are like empaths, you really have to practice kind of building a little bit of a more, um, I always think of that, I talk about like having a permeable wall. So you need a little less permeability to put it like over there and you can pull it out maybe five minutes a day and do all your worrying in there and all your sadness in there, but then let it go. Because if you're, if you're suffering all the time, it's not good for you. It's not really helping anybody. And um, yeah, you yeah. have to give yourself permission not to suffer. It's not doing yeah. it. What's best is if you take good care of yourself and then you figure out ways that you can help if you feel guilty, for example, that's another emotion we haven't addressed. People feel guilty because they can't do anything. They're helpless or they right. don't want to volunteer because that's just not what they do. They're not doctors. They chose not to be nurses. And um, then I, I think in terms of shifting the guilt to gratitude, right? If you're okay, um, the guilt isn't really helping anyone. It's just hurting you. If you shift from guilt to being grateful that you're okay and you don't have to do that and then find some way to, to take that gratitude and pay it forward. Whether you make a small donation to a cause, whether you, you do something like bringing food and dropping food at a neighbor's doorstep while you keep social distancing. While yeah. you, you know, my cousins um, who's a teenager is making masks and many other people are doing that. So just doing something that you can do, you know, mm -hmm. even, um, just taking care of your family and staying at home is being yeah. a good citizen. And you can really just say, I am being a good citizen. Maybe I'm happy that I'm not working. That's okay. You can be happy you're not working. Focus on the fact that you're staying at home, you're social distancing, you're not infecting others, you're making sure you don't get infected so you don't go into the hospital system and clog it. And that, right. that's the best. You can really, people can feel proud of that. Yeah, okay. So, then the grief, if, if the worst nightmare, right, is that you have someone who is sick and in the hospital and you can't do anything about it. I mean, that's hell. And yeah. you have to just validate that it's hell and be grief stricken. Yeah. Uh, don't let anyone tell you not to be grief stricken. Um, right. Reach out to people, cry when you need to, get support. Don't be alone so it turns into a depression that gets stuck. You want to cry and feel your feelings. And even though it is so excruciatingly painful, if you block it, uh, and, and, and maybe you have to suspend also, you know, it's not like you have to search for these feelings. Um, yeah. You know, if you're doing okay, let yourself be okay. Mm -hmm and just come back to it later. In other words, if you've lost somebody, uh, ultimately in the long haul of life, it feels that it's better for the mind and body to allow yourself to feel sadness, you know, and on a spectrum to, to grief, if we think of that all on the same, it's the same emotion, it's about loss. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think yeah. the message is to let yourself feel, meaning so many people, there's so many judgments. We spoke about this last time. The reason we block emotions is one, because we have no tools and we have no way they're scary to us. But another is because our society says that we're weak if we're feeling full people. And that's mm -hmm. just, it's just wrong. And it's a, it's a myth that is hurtful to people. So the learning about emotions, demystifying them, understanding their purpose, and then allowing yourself to experience them on your own or with a trusted other or a counselor is the way to go for long-term mental health. Okay. Um, you, you mentioned the technique earlier, like allowing yourself to feel it for like five minutes. Like if it's the, uh, if, if it's feeling, feeling bad, what's going on elsewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Like kind of setting aside time to really feel it 
mm-hmm. and then move on and then and then and then just know how to put it back at arm's length after that time's done i guess that's that sounds mm-hmm. like yeah, something useful. Yeah. yeah, it's the idea. Again, you know, there's no prescriptive. So if you're okay, your defenses are working well, mm-hmm. that's great. If yeah. you start to lash out at your family and behave badly, meaning you're hurting yourself by um, being self destructive, drinking too much, doing drugs, your eating disorders, kicking up. Um, you know, things that are internally hurting you or you're hurting others and acting in abusive ways, then that's the, that should be a signal to look at yourself, to notice you're in a defensive state and that you mm. probably have emotions that you have to tend to. Yeah. So there's a logic to it. It's not like it, you have to make yourself suffer if you're not suffering. It's just notice where you are on that triangle try to build in some awareness throughout the day of how you're behaving towards yourself and to others and yeah, yeah. if you're not happy with that re- refresh your memory with the change triangle mm-hmm. and validate the emotions and see what you can do to move through some of them and see then if you're if you're feeling better and if you're yeah. calmer and able to um live in a in a healthier way for you and the people around you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I like logic. There's sort of a logic to the whole thing that is um, yeah. pleasing. Yeah. Even though I'm now an emotion person, it's really that balance of using common sense and being educated about emotions and knowing a few tricks on how to move through them and how yeah. to change your state. Okay, yeah. I, I was actually just thinking about how when when bad things are going on in, in the world, it's like thoughts and prayers, right? Keep us in your prayers. Keep us in your thoughts. Right? So it seems like um, it, it, it's kind of an interesting tension between not wanting to forget what's going on, but also not wanting to let it just really disable you and drag you down. And the, I mean, you still have to function as if, you know, as if it's not happening, right? I mean, you you, you kind of have to be there for your family and not lash out. I mean, so that exactly. that seems like very, very challenging to, to try to strike that balance. I mean, because our instinct is to keep us in your thoughts, right? Think of it, um, give your thoughts and prayers to people. So, yeah. right. And, and even that idea, we could ask ourselves, okay, what's the feeling driving that idea that we have to keep someone 24 seven in our thoughts? Is yeah. It, is it guilt? Right. Uh, you know, and then you have to start to, you know, then, um, you know, in, in the, in, it's not always depression, the book, I sort of have like a list of questions to, as, to ascertain whether that guilt is actually serving you and others, or if it's actually debilitating. And that's when it might be like turning that guilt to gratitude. Like you don't have to stay worried all the time. What is the purpose of that? It's not helping. And I, I, and in the same way that um, I really recommend people do not watch the news 24 seven. I had to really yeah. you know, tell my husband the other day, cause he's a news junkie and he was making him anxious. And I was like, look, just have to have the discipline because mm-hmm. each time you read something, it's triggering naturally. That's cause yeah. we're human. So that's right. a good thing that we're human and we're feeling full, but you can have self-control and say, I'm, I'm going to watch, I'm going to listen to the news or read the news for an mm-hmm. hour at the best time of day mm-hmm. for me. So in other words, right before bed, if you have trouble sleeping because you're obsessing about all the suffering going on, it's not the best time to read the paper, maybe in right. the morning. And then right. that's it. And uh, like I'm, listening to, I'm really enjoying um, Cuomo's briefings. That's how I'm getting most of my... Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's like yeah. straight and to the point and I know what's going on and I, it's awful. Yeah. And then I... He gives it to you straight. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, what, when you're speaking with your um, your patients, like how, I guess, for want of a better way to say it, how how big of a issue is this to work through? You know, like like what's related to going on these days? I mean, is it is is it is it something that you can kind of move through and in, in a session or two, or is it is it kind of a continuing challenge for some people? I guess I'm just wondering. Just trying to get a sense of how, yeah, like how much, how how, how much work it's taking, I guess, for people to, um, to 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 manage their fears and anxieties, and how how big of an impact it's making, you know. Yeah, um, 
like I said, I don't know if my uh, practice is representative because okay. um, um, most of them are safe and yeah. working and um, so uh, the people that have more disruption in their daily life, like young children, and now they're at home working, we, you know, we, I begin a session with, let's, let's slow down, let's really slow down so we can notice how you're thinking, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, and like, where are you right now with all this? Yeah. yeah. We just kind of start fresh in the moment and see where somebody is. And, and that's the same advice I would give to someone on a daily basis. Like, where am I with this? Try to stay in the present moment. Mantras like one day at a time, one yeah. day at a time. If you're upset, one hour at a time. Like, just have to get through. Yeah. Um, are, are helpful, having some positive self-talk to put in there, especially if you're a worrier. Mm -hmm. I wrote a, an article, it came out a couple days ago on like the five, the five ways, five things that help me when I, that I say to myself on a, uh, on a daily basis, like this is temporary. Yeah. Uh, everything is likely going to be okay. You know, if you can't say everything is going to be okay, because that doesn't feel believable and you've lost something, I will get over this. I will survive. Like just kind of positive self-talk. But yeah. in answer to your question, everybody is really different. And I think that's the main thing. I mean, that's why I'm so in love with these tools and concepts about emotions because it's they're tools to customize for yourself and to understand how you're, how we, each of us is working. There's there's gen, you know, there, it applies to all humanity, the general phenomenology of, of emotions, right? We all kind of, um, we all feel anxious when we bury emotions and we yeah. all have, have emotions that we feel in our body. And when we tune into the body and we have compassion and we don't judge ourselves, we will, they will move. But how it exactly looks like and whether you can do it alone or, or whether you need more support really depends on your whole life before that preceded this and how much internal strength you've had because you had yeah. great parents and you feel supported and you've got a spouse or a partner and family and you feel bolstered. I, a lot of people who are feel I work with who are very alone and who've always felt yeah. alone and who were um, abused and neglected as children suffer much, much more, much more anxiety much yeah. shame, flagellation, you know, and that's where we work on those things, trying to help those parts of them to come, to feel loved and seen so that they can bring forth their most resilient adult parts and yeah. day to day. So, so people who might have already been struggling with, with fear and anxiety, um, something like this is going to be I mean, it's going to be a little harder, harder for them than I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. If you're yeah. prone to anxiety, then. Yeah. Is, is there any, is there any kind of, I guess, trauma or experience that's really comparable to what's happening today, just in terms of, I don't know, in, in terms of treating people, like, is there anything to liken it to, I guess, you know, like, um, um, I, I, I don't know. Um, um, I mean, I guess there isn't really. <laughs> I mean, it's a uh, not. Exactly. Um, I, I, yeah, no. I mean, but in, in a way, so you, you could compare it right to the other uh, the other scares, the little mini scares we've had, like SARS and Ebola. Mm -hmm. You could compare it to like nine eleven when everything was disrupted and right. But, but in a way, you don't even have to from from as an emotion educator. The standpoint is whatever triggers fear. So fear mm -hmm. is fear. Yeah. And, uh, Whatever is happening in the environment, if it triggers fear, then what we do with that fear and whether we bury it or make space for it and how we think mm -hmm. about it and how we solve problems is all going to happen sort of in the same way unique yeah. to each of us as individuals and that there is, there's always hope to keep mm -hmm. growing and to keep working. Um, and I think in my most difficult and traumatic times is when I grew the most. And so... Mm -hmm you know, there's platitudes like that, which doesn't kill you, makes you stronger, but they're true. Those pl they're platitudes because they are true. And so right. 
Yeah. People that have time to work on their anxiety and work on their emotions and their emotional health. It's yeah. A, it's a good thing to do. And um, it will save you for the rest of your life. Maybe it's a little reassuring to know that fear is fear, right? Whatever is triggering it, there are ways of dealing with it, right? Yeah. Uh, or and to learn what it is, right? So fear is like our eyes, our ears, our uh, pick up something that is perceived by us as being scary. And pretty much, I think, well, it's interesting. Not everybody I know is scared. And some people are scared of dying from the disease. And some people are scared because they're losing money in the stock market and that that's worse than dying. And so it's fascinating. So, but whatever, if fear is triggered in the middle of the brain, Mm -hmm. then is going to send messages to the body for that individual. And we're pretty much the same this way. That's going to ready ourselves to run. And that's mm -hmm. why, and this is not anything we can run from. So we're going to feel that energy in our body. And the way to process fear is to slow down to a snail's pace, grounding, mm -hmm. breathing, and feeling how the body is vibrating, for example, or trembling. And breathe deeply and let it move like people generally turn away from those weird physical sensations and I show people how to be with them lean into them because after a few minutes they will dissipate it's just a bio chemical physical reaction yeah a temporary reaction it's a trigger the body gets set off and then it yeah. resolves and right. so um, if we block it with tension we could get neck aches and back aches and um right it's not it's not good for us uh causes all sorts of uh, health problems if we can find a way to be with it meaning just to let it flow through us and not be scared of it and mm -hmm. that's why the education and emotions i just can't emphasize enough if you know what's what's supposed to happen it's much less scary if you demystify mm -hmm. emotions there's a chance you'll be able to practice some of these tools on your own Okay. So I'm hoping, you know, that people read it, it, the book. It's not always depression because it's like a how you, you remember reading it, right? It's like a, it's like, here's the, the lesson. Here's the exercise, practice it. Here's the next lesson. And by the end, you've, we've gone through each corner of the change triangle and the bottom. And okay. It, it's a recipe. Okay. And it's a self-help how to either yeah. alone or with people. Okay. Yeah. How's the book doing by the way? It's doing well. I mean, it's, it's, uh, what's exciting is it didn't sell a million copies, but I knew that was going to happen because emotion education, you know, emotions, you know, <laughs> then you, you have to learn a little bit about emotions to want to learn more. So it's that initial, right. right. but, um, I would say worldwide, it's probably sold about, um, well, at least in the UK and the United States, about 50,000 books. And okay. it, it's, it's in Chinese now. It's in okay. the Korean language. It's in Polish, Lithuanian, and Japan and uh, Spain just bought it. So okay. it's, you know, there's, it's, and it's the wave of the future. I think we're going to be learning the change triangle in high school, uh, hopefully within the next five years, because uh, okay. we don't yeah. need tools relationship yeah. skills for that matter too like you don't get any skills on how to relationship or parent like all these things that we could be teaching There's yeah ways to learn and things to learn that really make a big difference